and welcome to this bonus episode of Real Life Ghost Stories, where I am joined by very special guest, Paul Morrissey. Paul has written a play called When Darkness Falls, and the team invited me up to London to have a chat, and I obviously jumped at the chance. Just to point out that this was recorded on portable mics in a big echoey rehearsal studio in the middle of London. So the sound quality, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly listenable, but it's just a bit different than usual. So in this episode, Paul and I, we talk about horror films. We talk about ghosts. We talk about ghostly experiences. And most importantly, we talk about folklore. In particular, Paul tells me about the folklore and ghost stories of the island of Guernsey, which is where he grew up and which the play When Darkness Falls is based on. Even if you are not a UK listener, this episode is so worth the listen for the quality of the folklore and ghost stories of Guernsey Island alone. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis of the play. Some people believe in ghosts, some don't. Since their existence is not proved beyond all possible doubt, to many there remain folklore, the stuff of legend, spooky tales of beasts and spirits, spectres and ghouls. But to many others, ghosts are quite real. On a stormy night on the small island of Guernsey, a young paranormal expert joins a sceptical history teacher to record the first in a series of podcasts based on the island's incredible folklore and paranormal history. As the expert regales his horrifying stories, the teacher learns that we all have our own truth, our own story, ghosts that haunt us, that bring the past present and future together in unexpected ways. Ways that could threaten to unsettle everything we think we knew. Inspired by true events, this powerful new production by James Milton and Paul Morrissey draws us into dark pasts, reveals disturbing truths and explores the power of stories, perhaps most importantly, the ones we tell ourselves. When Darkness Falls is not just confined to London, it is coming to Richmond, Poole, Mould, Salford, Exeter, Dundee, Bromley, Leicester, Oxford and Eastbourne. And all tickets and information are at whendarknessfalls.co.uk and the link to that will be in the description of this episode. And I hope you enjoy the interview. So Paul, can you tell me a bit about yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Why are we here? <laughs> Who am I? Should I start with the why are we here? Because I think this, no, no, no. Yeah, let's wait, go down wait. the philosophical yeah, road straight exactly, away. Straight away. Let's just <laughs> get straight in there. Who am I? Um, so my name is Paul Morrissey and I am the writer and director of the play When Darkness Falls, which is a ghost story. Oh, and we, you know, surprisingly love a ghost story around here. I've heard, actually. Yeah. Very important question yeah. before we start. Yeah. This sets the tone for the rest of the interview. Okay. What is your favourite horror film and why? Oh, okay, so this is a really difficult question because, obviously, the favourite film question is difficult anyway, isn't it? Because there's so many, depending on what mood you're in. But I'm a big M. Night Shyamalan fan. Oh, fair. Um... And the so, king of the twist. The king of the twist. I just love it. Um, and so I'd say anything by him, apart from Signs, which I thought was terrible. <gasps> Did you really think Signs was yeah. terrible? Yeah. But then I think you're always, I think you're always straddling that with somebody like M Night Shyamalan because he he's really brave and so he's prepared to do things that other filmmakers wouldn't or couldn't do. And so therefore you risk it being amazing or rubbish. I think. Like, and that's. I think that's totally fine, do you know what I mean? I think there's a beauty in signs in that I always find it's terrifying up until the point where you see the alien. And always. Then, and then you go, I could take that. Always. <laughs> I can, I can, oh, I can do you. That's fine. Yeah, I know. I felt exactly the same about Jeepers Creepers, which I thought was, without question, the scariest film I've ever seen for an hour. Yeah. And then I saw the alien and went, oh, uh, you know all that. And you also have to question with <laughs> Jeepers Creepers, he got a personalised licence plate. How? <laughs> Someone explain that to me. Exactly. <laughs> so we're going for anything twisty. I mean, are you a sixth sense kind of guy? Yeah, that's obviously what started yeah. it, isn't it? I mean, that, it? Was a, that was iconic. It's iconic, isn't it? Um, but I, I, I love... Uh, there's a, a TV series at the moment called Servant. Have you yes. seen that? So that's on Apple at the moment. And that's Shyamalan. And well, I mean, it's sort of Shyamalan. and it's not all Shyamalan. And, but um, it, it's, it's that constant sitting on the edge of not understanding where it's going and so your, your heart rate is all always racing do you know what I mean I don't know where we're going with this I don't know what the camera's going to show me next you know 
I've, I love all of that. And so, yeah, Servant's great. I, it finishes this season. I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> But then I heard the cast talking and neither do they, so... Oh, that's exciting. I do yeah. like a TV show where the cast don't know themselves yeah. what's happening yeah. next. I think it adds a certain je ne sais quoi it, it certainly to it. does, yeah. So we're here because of When Darkness Falls. Yes. Can you tell me a bit about the general premise? And actually, while you're here, because you wrote this... Yeah. ...how it came to be? Sure. I mean, how it came to be is, is uh, a good start, actually, because... Um, I've, I've always dabbled in writing. I'm, I, I originally trained as an actor uh, and then became a producer, have directed and have written. And I know that that doesn't really fit in with the mould in theatre. You tend to stick to your corner, which I've always had a bit of a problem with, it, 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 as in I've been a little bit embarrassed that I, you know, try and juggle a few different things. But I think... I now answer the question, being a certain age that I am, and I go, do you know what? I've just been around a lot and I've done a lot of stuff. Do you know what I mean? And, and um, I've, if somebody says to me now, what do you do? Instead of saying I'm a writer or a director, or, I, I would just say I do theatre. And I think that I really enjoy all aspects of it. You know, I've had the fortune to dabble in all aspects. I then, to, to bring us back to Darkness Falls, was going to produce a show in the Channel Islands, in Guernsey, which is where I'm originally from. We booked the theatre, we booked the show, we booked the actors, and then the rights for the play were rescinded because I think a bigger production was being mounted in the UK. And we had a theatre space for four weeks, uh, in four weeks' time for one week in the Channel Islands. And I thought to myself, I don't really want to let that opportunity go. I'd like to put something on because why not? I've got a space and I've got an audience and I've got a cast. So my idea was to put on an evening of folklore and superstitions from the Channel Islands because I just thought it's intriguing. I've always had, I've always had an interest in it. I wanted to learn more. And so we plotted literally the idea that uh, an actor would come forward with a binder and creepily read some ghost stories from, from Guernsey. That, that was the idea. Uh, I started writing it and just putting those stories down. And I think the second I started with the first story, I was like, hang on a second, this is really theatrical. This, this is really engaging. This is really interesting. I was learning things. I was getting excited by things. And then I got to the second story and then the third story. And when I got to the third story, I, just an idea came to me of going, hang on a second, what if there is a fourth story that in fact ties the other three stories together? And instead of it being a night of just stories, it could in fact be a play. And so I wrote it. Simple as that. I just started writing and just used, I guess, the, the templates of the stories that I'd found to create the fourth story. Um, and and it, I had a language, I had a setting, I, you know, it just started to come together. Wow, that's so exciting. I had no idea that it was born of sort of necessity. It's like, we've got this space, let's put something in there. Yeah. And then you realised, oh my God, this could actually be a functioning play in its own right. Yeah, so it was, there was a very specific moment that I, I, I had this idea, I just had it, it, literally this idea that a man came onto the stage at start dripping wet, but completely unexplained as to why. And that was the kernel of the idea of going, what if that is the, th if I can find that character's thread through the next three stories. Um, and, and that is still in it today. That element of, of that kernel of an idea is still in the play now. So it's funny how these things happen, isn't it? You go, where did that even come from? I think that and other ideas for this came from Guernsey itself. Yeah. It, it came from the idea of an island and the isolation of an island and the folklore that islands have and and how you know I, like I say I'm originally from Guernsey so I'd been surrounded by these myths growing up and I'd seen the places that feature in the play I'd seen them not really fully engaged with it um, but they were always in my subconscious somewhere so the idea of, of yeah 
them formulating and turning into a play is, I guess, not a huge leap, but I didn't see it coming. So what happens in When Darkness Falls without giving away too many spoilers? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could probably be here for a long time <laughs> talking about it and still not give it away because it's not, it, it's complex, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult piece in, in a good way. Like, it, it challenges you, it makes you think. Um, and that's been born out of, you know, like I say, we started writing that version of it seven years ago. It's been developed and it's been put on and, and it's grown and, uh, and turned into the piece it is today. Um, what's it about? It's about um, a history teacher in Guernsey who lives in a world where facts dictate everything. So he's incredibly black and white about the world, about life, uh, and particularly about ghosts. So in his world, there is no empirical evidence of ghosts, so therefore they do not exist. He then is doing something very similar to this. He's recording a podcast. And he's recording a podcast for the local historical society, and the historical society have suggested to engage a more youthful audience that his podcast is actually about the paranormal, which, of course, he hates the idea of, but he does it nevertheless. And he does it with an eye on going, OK, come on, let's, let's do this. And he invites a special guest. So, essentially, in my story, my history teacher is you, and the special guest is me, and he comes along and does exactly what I'm doing now. He talks to, he talks to the history teacher about the paranormal. He's a inverted commas specialist on the paranormal. And so what you have is a guy who comes in who now sees in greys and he does believe in the paranormal. He does believe in ghosts. And you have a history teacher who categorically doesn't. And it's a play about them changing their minds and discovering things along the way that I definitely, definitely can't tell you. <laughs> but I can tell you that much. So let's discuss the inspired by true events. Yes. So we all love, for example, a horror film. And when you, when you see it's inspired by true events, yes. it transports you into a different world of fear. <clears throat> so what are the true events that inspired When Darkness Falls? Sure. So there are three, there are four stories in our play, as I said at the start. So the, the fourth story is entirely made up as a story, but it is set against a very real incident, which is the Great Storm of 1986. Yeah, so that's the story that ties everything together. That's as much as I'm giving you. Okay, oh. yeah, yeah. Um, but the other three stories, in terms of uh, the, the truth of them, is that all three of them exist as places. Uh, one is a haunted house. It's w what people on Guernsey call the haunted house. One is the German underground hospital, which is the largest... Um, sort of fortification that the Germans made when they occupied Guernsey. You know, because, you know, I don't know how many people know, but see, we, we say in the play that the Second World War is, is starting to become pages in a history book now, and some people don't know or they've forgotten or never really engaged with the fact that the Germans did occupy the Channel Islands. They occupied Guernsey, they occupied Jersey, and there are remnants of their occupation littered across the island. There's Martello Towers, which exist, there's bunkers everywhere and the biggest as I say is the underground hospital and it's just a series of very very scary tunnels and it was built by forced labourers it genuinely is about 10 degrees colder than the outside when you walk in and there's no real attributable reason as to why um, there are definitely is definitely an energy, a feel, a something in that building that is not right. Um, you know, I'm sure some people would tell you that is X, Y or Z things, but there is definitely a feeling that it is supernatural, if, if that makes sense. Um, and the third story is about the great the Guernsey Martyrs, which are three witches who were really burnt in... Guernsey and the Great Witch Trials. Again, one of the last places in the United Kingdom where that still happened. And a piece of history that Guernsey people obviously sort of want to forget. You know, it, it was barbaric. Um, and so those are the three events, those are the three locations, and they, th they 
burn three individual ghost stories. So hauntings by uh, an English soldier in the underground hospital, hauntings by one of the witches who had her... I mean, this is an incredible story. One of the witches was called Peritine Massey, and she had a baby in the flames when she was tied to the stake. The baby was retrieved by a bystander, and then the bailiff of Guernsey demanded that the baby be thrown back into the flames. And so Peritine Massey is st- said to still haunt Guernsey. I mean, if, if ghosts exist because they can't rest, well, then that's a reason, isn't it? You know, how can you rest from that? So that's, that's a real um, documented uh, event. And um, the first story about the haunted house still exists. The haunted house still exists. I went there a few weeks ago, you know, and part of my research again, I went back out. And it's this, if you can imagine a child's drawing of a house, that's exactly what it looks like. It's, it's creepy just in the fact that it is, it's entirely on its own on the peninsula. It is said to have had a number of ghostly occurrences that have happened there. And we pick up on one of them in the play. So as a Guernsey native, do you have a favourite piece of folklore or ghost story about Guernsey that maybe is or isn't included in the play? I think the, uh, I think the the Guernsey Martyrs one is my favourite one because it, it spurns two different ghost stories, actually, or two different, I don't know if one can be called a ghost story or not, it's terrifying, but so the idea of witches still haunting or a witch still haunting the island I do find really creepy Um, and that whole story is so awful Um, but there's also the story of Shen Bodu which is the dog of the dead there's loads and loads of different names across you know across the spectrum for Shen Bodu ranging from the bogeyman to you know um, yeah like I say the dog of the dead Um, and that black dog that motif has been used a lot across uh, the island. Like, it's said to appear to foreshadow terrible events. So one thing I said about the um, final story is set against the backdrop of the Great Storm of 1987, and there are three apparent sightings of Shen Bodu clanking around with his chains, you know, on the night of the Great Storm. Like, three... Uh, fishermen said they saw him it and listen i don't know about you but as far as i'm aware fishermen are notoriously truth tellers you know so if a fisherman tells a story i'm believing it i believe it yeah i'm not i'm not having that that's a lie they've seen things they've seen yeah exactly (laughs) so has working on a ghost story for so long put you more in touch with your spiritual side now you can read into spiritual side in whatever way you want but has it made you more in touch with your spiritual side i mean has it directly uh, yeah maybe because i think i think what happens when you write a play like this is that you you know i'm very keen on research as a writer so i i want to research everything you know if um if it's a history play and somebody drinks a cup of coffee, I want to know that they could have drunk a cup of coffee at that point in time. I want to know that it was available. I, want, I, I do a lot of research to make sure that everything stacks up. Um, I want to make sure the dates stack up, to make sure all the locations stack up, the journeys, whatever they might be, everything stacks up. So I, I immerse myself in the research of it quite heavily. I don't see how that can't take a toll on you in some way, shape or form, because you're exposed to new information, you're exposed to new things, you're exposed to new ideas. Um, I think I would say the major thing that it exposed me to is, it's not that I don't believe in ghosts, which is normally the first question you get asked when I do interviews is, do you believe in ghosts? Uh, My answer isn't a straightforward answer, because it's not that I do or don't believe in ghosts, or did or didn't believe in ghosts. I erred on the side of the history teacher, which is that I personally have never seen one. And so therefore, it's quite difficult for me to say with any sort of clarity that they do exist. However, have I felt things or experienced things? Yes. Are they always explainable? No. And when you start working on a play like this, it opens you up to the possibility that, you know, a ghost doesn't necessarily have to be how we perceive a ghost in like the Scooby-Doo world where they've got a sheet on their head and they run around scaring people. I think a, 
ghosts for me have sort of started to become things like trauma and memory and I don't know things that just in their own way haunt you energies in rooms like I said about the underground hospital when you go in there there's something in those walls I don't know if it's the forced laborers that worked there that died in horrible conditions I don't know if it's just the general darkness of like Nazism or I don't know what it is but there is something in those walls I often have that conversation with people because like you I'm not necessarily a believer but I'm also not not a believer yeah. I don't know what I am and there are certain places where like you say there is something in the walls for whatever reason whether it's you know years of human suffering or you just you just don't know and there are certain places that just <laughs> creep you right feeling, out yeah and you think oh there's more oh, to this yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so why do you think then as a writer and a researcher why do you think ghost stories have such a universal popularity because there's always people like me and you for example who don't really believe but who still dabble in a yep. ghost story or two and then there's obviously hardcore believers and there's the people who don't believe and who are desperate to disprove yeah so why do you, why do you think there is a universal popularity i think there's like stratas of that answer isn't there so like you know in terms of like movies and books i think we inherently quite like being scared i think we like the roller coaster feel you know, I think we compare it in the play to a roller coaster. Actually, it's that we say that there's there's something called the flood, and the flood is when you get a rush of adrenaline, and then you realise you're actually okay, and when you realise you're okay, that adrenaline rush sort sort of turns into a like a euphoric feeling because you're like, I did it, I conquered it, I survived it. You know, whether it's the roller coaster or or a roller coaster actual event in your life, you go, I I, I got the adrenaline, I'm okay. I survived it, this is all good. I like that feeling, and I think that goes with a ghost story. We like being scared, we like being taken to the edge of things like that, I think. I certainly do when I watch M. Night Shyamalan films. I'm like, go on, go on. I, I can't watch, but I am watching. Do you know what I mean? It's that scary, can't take my eyes away, but I know you're about to make me jump, you know, and we like that. So I think that's sort of the first strata. Um, I think probably the second one is more personal to some of us, which is that, I don't know, maybe we quite like the idea that there's life after death because it's in some way comforting, especially if you've lost a loved one, if you've lost, if you've lost someone that means something to you, the idea that they might in some way still potentially inhabit our earth in some way, shape or form, can bring comfort to people, it can also bring total fear to others, but... I don't know, I wonder if that's something as well, that there's a link there. Yeah, probably. We don't like, I think as humans, we don't like the idea of an end. I think no, we don't. I think it's probably no. why we, like all over the world, we are, we are so ritualistic about death is because we're not quite ready to accept death as the end, just as the human race. You've sort of half answered this question, so I'm going to open it up a little bit more. Okay. Have you had a paranormal experience that you'd like to share or somebody in your life have had a paranormal experience that has been really profound that you'd like to share? I haven't personally, but very interestingly, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this uh, because I think he might have said it before. No, I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to say his name, but I will say that there's, and you can work it out if you want to, there's somebody that's close to this play that has been in the cast that, that people know. Um, and he was telling me about an experience that he had, which um, I found incredibly moving and, and uh, I don't know, yeah, very, very interesting, which is that he said that his, um, he came home one day and his mother, um, I think, had fallen down the stairs and she was very, very near the end of her life. And he called the ambulance, and as the ambulance arrived, in that moment, he, she passed away. And he said at that exact moment, he felt something move through him as a physical, visceral thing. And he said, before I even looked at her, he said it was just holding her, and before I even looked at her, I knew she had gone. 
and this person doesn't lie and doesn't exaggerate and doesn't make things up. So you go, okay, what happened then? What is that? And that sort of corroborates my feelings on it of energy or mm. something. Do you know what I mean? You go, something happened. So not, not to me, but to somebody I know who I trust, if that yeah. makes sense. And there are lots of people who, through this line of work, I'm, I'm sure you experience the same thing. People tell me their ghost stories all the time, and I'm sure because, because you write spooky plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people tell you their ghost yeah, stories do, all the yeah. time. <laughs> and when people find out what I do, and they, they will often say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't believe in ghosts, I don't believe in ghosts. But one time, this really Yeah, weird yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was me. just thinking, actually, Thomas Dennis, who is one of the actors in this, came into the rehearsal room the other day, and he was telling me about his... His family used to own a pub um, or run a pub somewhere. And he said that they were sitting in the pub one day. It was, it, there was a lot of uh, creepy stories that existed about this pub. And, you know, people like to spin a yarn, if you like. And he said that some of the family were sitting in uh, one of the rooms. And completely inexplicably, the glass panes in the window of one of the windows all blew out. So not in but out onto the road, as in whatever the energy was, whatever happened came from inside the room, which that's the, that's the interesting bit for me because I don't know this, like right now we're in London and we're by a window and there's a road outside where a car is reverberating outside. You can imagine that if that got too loud or yeah. something that the, win the windows might break in. I mean, it's unlikely, but that could happen. But the other way round seems really unlikely to me and that I find that unexplainable I don't know if I don't know what that therefore means but I find it unexplainable there's something really alluring about an oddity yes there's a really strange that will happen and I find them far more interesting sometimes than a traditional ghost story I yeah. just love an oddity yeah an oddity exactly. <laughs> an odd little moment where you go what I don't know how that happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> there could be a natural explanation but I don't know what that yeah. is yeah so finally why should people come and see When Darkness Falls? So When Darkness Falls is... It's just a... a it's a two-hander for a start. So you've just got two people on stage. Um, and in this particular case with this cast, Tony Timberlake and Thomas Dennis play um, the history teacher and the guest, respectively. And, I mean, I, I've just come for them. I mean, they are just mm. mesmerising actors. They're phenomenal. Um, I did have a look at their, you know, past credits and I was very impressed. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah ridiculous. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, you, uh, they've done more shows than I can remember, yeah. you know. And I, and I will say, having read reviews from previous runs of the show, the reviews just said the acting was outstanding. Yeah, the acting, so. the acting is, is terrific in it. So that's, that's probably my, one of my main reasons. I think the other reason is because... It's a ghost story. It's fun and it's exhilarating and it will scare you and it will make you jump. But I really hope it makes you think as well. My dream for Darkness Falls has always been that when it finishes, you go to the bar and you have an argument with your family. Yeah. Because I think it does that. It raises so many questions that you just end up going, oh my God, was that, was he... Does that mean, you know, and I love, I love all of that. I've seen it loads of times when we've been to the theatre. It's my, I, I went to see it in Blackpool and there was, I, I hadn't realised because it was just, you know, a whole row and then a whole row in front um, at the back of the stalls. I hadn't realised was all a family of some sort or family and friends. So when everyone got up and left at the end, these two rows remained and I, I sort of was looking at them and thinking, what, what, what's, why are they still there? And then the front row turned around to the back row and went, did you get it? Did you understand the bit about this? And then they all started arguing and fighting. Does that mean he's a... And all of this, these questions that started firing out. And I was like, yes! <laughs> That's what it. I wanted. Yeah, I feel yeah. like, with the way you describe it, it sounds like the type of play where when you get to the end and you're going, did you see that bit? No, but what if that means that, that you want to go back and watch it again? I, do you know <laughs> what? what and, you and I'm not being funny, but my uh, M. Night Shyamalan fixation, I think, has come through in this because we call them callbacks. In yeah. our, so, so what we do is, you know, in a film, you have the luxury of, in that last moment, I think of um, M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable. 
in the last moment where Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis shake hands and the camera goes doo, 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 and shows you 20 things that happened in the film yeah. that make you go, oh my God, it was there in front of me all the time. Or a bit like Sixth Sense. Yeah. You know, when you go, oh my God, he said this and that and the other, of course. We do that, but of course we don't have the luxury of film, so we call them callbacks. So you have to be paying attention, you know. So here's my advice as an expert is uh, you just need one of those camera callbacks. Just all of a sudden a projector comes down and goes... Yeah, 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 exactly. Remember this, remember this, remember this. He said this. Yeah, exactly. But I think you're right. I think you definitely... I think people really enjoy it the first time. I think people sort of love it the second time because they go, oh, he says that line. Clever. Yeah. yeah. And we're really, you know, I'm a bit... Look, let's get it out on the table. I want to be M. Night Shyamalan, and don't I? I quite clear. You With know, that's hour, fine. That's okay. We appreciate yeah, that's yeah. fine. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to M. Night Shyamalan it up. Yeah. You know, so when we're in the rehearsal room, I, I keep shouting at the cast, going, oh, "What if we did this?" <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "Paul, would you just leave it? Like, that's, it's clear enough." <laughs> they're going, "We can't all have been dead." Exactly. The whole time. Like, could we not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so how do people catch When Darkness Falls? I know you're going on tour. So we're going on tour. So it's going where on. Where can they catch it? Yeah, so it's going on tour um, far and wide for 10 weeks from next week, actually. We open in Richmond next week. Um, you can find out about it on our website, I guess, is the easiest place because it's a centralised location, which is whendarknessfalls.co.uk, and it's got all the tour dates and links to the venues. And we're going from London right up to Scotland, so hopefully... Oh, amazing. We should see you. For a lot of people, because the people listening to the podcast, they're far and wide. And a lot of the time, they don't have the capacity to travel down to London to see a play. So I'm excited to be able to promote something that's traveling. Yeah, and that was really key. It's really key to us is to be able to take this out to people. You know, it's a story. It's a story about stories. And it's a story about, you know, ghosts and folklore and and communities and why those folklore exist. So we need to take it out to those communities, you know? So it's, we're really excited about it. Thank you so much for listening to today's bonus episode of Real Life Ghost Stories. Thank you so much to Paul Morrissey and the team at When Darkness Falls for taking the time out to talk to me. I really enjoyed it. I had a lovely day and oh, it just, it was so lovely to be sat in a rehearsal room in London talking to a writer and director about ghost stories and folklore and folklore that I never knew about until that point. So Guernsey is definitely somewhere that I'm going to be looking into to do an episode about. When Darkness Falls is, like I said, it's it's coming to somewhere near you. It's moving all over the UK. So it's definitely worth checking out. WhenDarknessFalls.co.uk The link will be in the description of this episode. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Please do let me know if you go and see it because I'd love to... I, well, I'm going to go see it next week and I'd love to have somebody to talk to about the play with me. So let me know if you do end up going to see it. And on that note, I shall see you next time. <laughs>